episode is Ethna Trainer, a professional conference moderator and international communications consultant. Having worked as a business TV reporter, Ethna's expert knowledge covers energy, technology, security, infrastructure, and leadership. She is the founder and CEO of eTrainer Media, a successful communications training company based in Dubai, UAE. As a former international broadcast journalist, her TV reporting experience spans major television networks, including ABC News, Sky News, BBC World, Bloomberg and CNBC. Ethna Trainer, thank you for being here today on the Life Lab. It's such a pleasure to have you. It's a big honour. Well, it's great to join you here. It's good. I'm really looking forward to this. Me too. Me Maybe too. I'm a little bit nervous because I'm usually on the other side. So I'm you have nervous. to remember. <laughs> I'm nervous because uh, to, you know, interview a legendary moderator, one of the most prestigious. He'll get over. Revered. I'll get over. <laughs> moderators in the region. But it's really a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. So I wanted to start off with um, to, to ask you about your childhood and, you know, growing up and, you know, lead into where you are today. I mean, looking back that far, do you want to have you, how long have we got? We've got um, it. This could be a while. But um, I suppose I had a pretty normal childhood growing up in the 60s in Ireland, like a whole lot of other people. It was a very, very different country. Mm. Um, you think of where it is now in terms of, I think, its position in the globe and its uh, influence. And I think its creativity and initiative. It was a very, very different country back in the day. But um, yeah, life was good. I grew up in a small town in the west of Ireland in County Galway. And um, there were six six of us in the family and my parents. So it was a pretty busy house. And uh, went to school, did all normal things. But I always had, I suppose I was always a little bit different. I was always sort of doing something different. I might have, uh, you know, they might have said I had attention span deficit or something really? back in the day. But, uh, yeah. you know, I was very busy. But nobody knew back then, so it didn't really matter. And it was good for me. But I, I needed to be really busy and I was forever doing a million and one things. And um, when I was young, I think I, I wanted to be, I really wanted to be a politician or a lawyer. Really? Like that was what barrister. you wanted to do? That, that, that was it. That's where I was heading. Yeah, yeah. Was that because that was probably like such a, that was the big goal to have then? Like people couldn't have imagined a job like yours back No, no, the, the big goal to have then, I think, um, you know, quite honestly, uh, would have been to be a teacher or a nurse or you know, as my, my father used to say, get yourself a wee job. A wee job gotcha. down the down the town there. He was from Northern Ireland, so he was just waiting for me to get a wee job. But uh, I kind of, uh, I so, thought I'd get a big one. And so what, so you wanted to be a, a barrister or a politician. Then what led you into become a journalist? And it was probably the very best thing that I did was become a journalist. Because when I was at university and, and even going to university, uh, it wasn't, it actually wasn't over encouraged, which I know people find incredibly difficult to believe in this day and age. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and then I went to Trinity College in Dublin and, you know, that was not encouraged. And I think that must just, have been hard then. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was very, I was at a Catholic girls school. Yeah. And um, they just didn't get the application forms for it. I mean, it was that simple. Yeah. So I had to go and do it myself. So it, there was no support on that one. And and, and then the, I got in, which was there, fabulous. There, mu there mustn't have been many women even then, really, were there? Or there were a lot less than now, obviously. There were quite a few of the girls in our school that would have gone to university, yes. But they would have gone to Galway. Okay. Um, so you going off to Dublin. So I was going to Dublin, yeah. yeah. I was just, which I was just like thought, a big deal then. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get far away, which is, which is terrible. But, um, you know, and it's a fabulous small town and I love to go back and I love to see people there. And yeah. there's, um, you know, I really enjoy going back there, but it just wouldn't have ever been for me to live there, to work there, no. to be there. You know, because you so, went, you, you ended up working so like all over was, the world, like in the States. And yeah, so what happened? So you went to university in Trinity and you studied. And I didn't get into law. So, um, but uh, it, it was fine that I didn't get into law because another colleague of mine who, did the same course as I did, then went into law. And I, I don't know, actually, I, I'm very glad I didn't do yeah. it. And um, then I'm very glad I didn't go into politics because I think I did some student union sort of student politics back in the day. And that really, I think, Turned opened my eyes that I thought, no, I wouldn't want to be a politician either. So actually becoming a journalist was this happy medium, which was just fabulous because it had sort of all of the, the buzz about politics or about, 
you know, being fighting and, and for rights. I wouldn't have wanted to have been a corporate lawyer. I would have been wanted to be a, you know, a, a barrister. I would yeah. have wanted to be a criminal lawyer or something like that. I mm. had a great sense of justice, I think. Or, um, so all of that kind of came together. And actually becoming a journalist was the perfect. just definitely, it was, you know, for me, when I look back, the absolute perfect thing that I could have done. And what happened after you graduated then? You went to live in the States, didn't you? I was uh, back and forth to America because I was working there in the summer. And I do remember when I started at Trinity, I did the business side of economics and social studies at the time. And then I got very bored with that as well because for at some point I did think that I might want to go down the business route and maybe become an accountant. Really? I can't imagine you being an accountant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't think my father believed it at the time because I had just spent sort of a wild year in London in between school and actually going to college. Um, so they didn't know what hit them when they came back and I said that I was going to do business studies. And very quickly, I, I really didn't like it. Um, and then I, but luckily the faculty is a joint faculty at Trinity. So I didn't have to leave the faculty, sadly, which many people do if they're in a course they don't like. Yeah. They have to actually stop that, then reapply and start the whole process again. You not to do that. And I didn't have to do that. And sadly, I've seen that happen to so many young people. And they actually, they sometimes just don't go back to college at all. Yeah, they just, because they, they don't, don't want to start again. It's too much and, trouble, mm -hmm. whereby I just skipped a year, so to speak, and then started with a new group. Okay. And it was the best thing I ever did. I really, really enjoyed it. And what um, did you start then? You started... Then I started politics, sociology, psychology. It was just a very different course. And many of them were the foundation courses within the first one I started. And it was much more what I was interested in. And we were very active with student union politics. And, uh, you know, we were busy trying to put the world to right, right, as one should do when you're a student, you know. Absolutely, yeah, that's the time to, to start. It is the time yeah. to, you know, we had we had great theories on how we could fix things. And uh, we, we knew at the time we had the answers. We certainly thought we did. We learned that one pretty quickly. Um, but it was great. It was yeah. great fun. There were, you know, it was a dynamic time and there were plenty of really interesting people there. Um, so it was great fun. But then um, I had a qualification and a degree in, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I dabbled a bit in journalism within the Students' Union magazine and things mm. like that. So I kind of wanted to go down that route. But it was when I was in the U.S. that I really decided I was going to go into television. And there was a very alternative school in Chicago called okay. Columbia College. Okay. And I was in Chicago. So you were and, working in Chicago. Yeah, and I knew about this very, you know, Particular. different place or this this hip place that did, I think it was one of the first universities that did like now what everybody is doing, the concept of actually, you know, doing practical journalism. Wow. So, so everybody who was there was working in the industry. Is that a cool, I mean, I know Oprah started her career right in Chicago, didn't yeah. she? So well, it's like, it's. And I nearly worked on that show. It, on Oprah's Oprah show. show. No way. Yeah, yeah. But it was, I wanted to work in news and I had got a job um, in Chicago and I was pretty much on the rotation f with the interns and that show came in. Um, but I never really wanted to work on a on talk TV, show. On a talk so we show. didn't know who she was at the time, obviously, but I just thought, um, not really would I want to work on a show like that. Yeah. Um, and I just, I wanted to do news yep. and I held out and I got a job with ABC News with the network in Chicago. That's amazing. So it was 10 times better. And how long um, were you? And I'm not sure with Oprah and I, we might have not seen. <laughs> two, two big personalities <laughs> that could, just wouldn't have meshed well. Why yeah, the work. Um, and what, how long did you work in the States for it then? Oh gosh, I was there for, um, I suppose I was there for 10 years and all. 10 with, years. With college. And it in was great. Chicago, most, always in Chicago. And Chicago. And then um, I moved to Milwaukee. I moved to Wisconsin. Wow. For another TV job. Yes. So um, a better job. That's It's sort of how the market works in America. Okay. And the ones who are smart about it move around move those around. markets very, very quickly. And even though Chicago is a really big market, doing a better job in a smaller market often gets you back to a big market very quickly. Okay. Okay. So that's how you kind of yeah. step up the ladder, basically move around. Yeah, you just, you... And there's plenty, you know, I mean, I don't know what number markets it would be. It'd go down to like hundreds and that, and then wow. people jump. And Around. get back to the New York, San Francisco, Chicago, um, you know, the key markets, the top 10. That's where everybody wants to work, clearly. And then after 10 years of working in TV in the US, you decided to come back home? or Yeah, I came back home and I, I actually talked to our one 
channel that we had at the time in Ireland. Is... And um, they literally did say to me, you know, you think you can come back here because you've worked in America for 10 years and we should give you a job. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I did. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. I have that degree from Trinity College. I'm Irish. I have, yeah, I have all States. that experience. Um, I have the same experience as uh, who was there at the time. Joe Duffy, Anya Lawler. These were all my, my yeah. groups in Trinity and they were at RT at the time. They're still there. And um, he literally said, no, it doesn't necessarily qualify you to work here. That's I couldn't crazy. believe it. crazy. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. But then I went to London and fortune just changed very, very quickly there. So okay. it was great. So you went back to London then. And then I did a couple of years on the slog, which I think every young journalist has to do. Mm. And it's not fun. Um, and it's the freelance circuit. And you just knock on doors. Get work. And, you know, you get work or you mm. don't get work. And you become, you know, very resilient because... You're there's a lot to, of no's. Yeah, there's a lot of no's, yeah. That's yeah. actually a really good yeah. thing to do as a journalist, isn't it? Just going out knocking on doors and you get more confident, right? Oh, yeah. you're just well, like, you're forced to, you've no choice. Because you're so used to being told no that you just lose all shame and just keep asking and eventually someone says yes. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you really, really do. And and again, on the freelance circuit, you know, you needed a week here and there. Um, so it was really good. It was a busy time and Sky News had only been open Wow. A couple of years at the time when I was there. Um, so the introduction of 24-hour news and then shortly after that, BBC World Service um, was working and I worked there as well. So there was a lot more work. Mm -hmm. But it was still really, really tough to get into. Yeah. I mean, it's extremely competitive. And to get uh, to get on air is hugely competitive yeah. there because... Hugely. Even know, now it's still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look like for big state, you know, big oh, networks yeah. and things. Yeah. And they let you know very, very quickly, you know, that there is like a line of people waiting around the corner looking for your job. job yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it it is as cutthroat and competitive, I think, as it was back then. I, yeah. I don't think it's a there's a nicer, gentler face to uh, actually working in television, no. especially if you want to do on air. It's tough. Yeah, yeah, it's a tough, tough. But and then so you went to the UK, you were working there, more TV, more journalism. How did you end up? becoming a founder of eTrainer like that's a huge you know obviously like y you had the credentials to open a, a, a communications consultancy and train people but how did you go from being the journalist to you know moving into that and that field? journey had a bit of a detour as well it didn't I didn't just end up being stopping being a journalist one mm. day and then deciding I was going to do this but when I was a journalist, I always found, you know, it was never really in my interest to embarrass anybody no. or to, you know, so if somebody had given an answer that I thought maybe they could give a better answer, I might ask it again. Um, if I'd m heard something that was incorrect, um, you know, I'd ask that question again. And, you know, so people would ask me, literally, they just would say, you know, do you do media training? Mm. It's like, no. No, I'm a journalist. I wouldn't touch it. And I wouldn't. I mean, it's not what you should do when if you're, you're a, journalist. a working journalist. Yeah. I mean, it's just crossing a line. Yeah. You do one or you do the other because, you know, you expect the executives, you expect government ministers, you expect prepared. everybody to come prepared. Yeah. And they should know. And there should be people like me out there mm. um, actually training them if need be. Or they should know well enough if they're in those positions, they should be ready with the answers and they should be well able to do it. But... Um, I finished at CNBC on my last year of contract there. I got an opportunity to go to Russia, oh. which uh, was very interesting at the time. And I was getting a little bit bored because I was doing the market reports for CNBC on the floor of the stock exchange, which was a room in uh, London. Wow. There, there, There is no floor. If you're in America or places like that where they're still trading on the floor, it's fun and it's interesting. Yeah. And I did some time actually when Amsterdam still had a, a working trading floor that was actually fun to do for a while. So, uh, you know, it was just every day in and out. The market's up, the market's down. We've got a bit of activity in the engineering sector in this and that. And you're like, oh, why am I doing this? But the saving grace on that was I covered the energy market. Okay. So I would get several times a year Actually, I would go to Vienna with all the other journalists and we would cover the energy market. So that was the highlight of my season of, yeah. you know, every quarter at least we'd be there. Do that trip. Um, so that had a lot more, you know, interest going on there. And I really, really enjoyed that. 
So when I had left, just the, this job in Russia came up and I just thought this would be fascinating. What job was it? Be, with it was to help them set up Russia's first financial television. Wow. That's and when incredible. you think about it, I mean, I went from BBC into Bloomberg into CNBC. So I went from being a, okay, a normal television journalist, so to speak, to become a business television journalist. Okay. And you have to remember there weren't a whole lot of business, business television films. journalists. Yeah. They were business print journalists. And that's a very, very different skill. Mm, yeah. Because you know, you're I always say like... the, the print journalists who we all like to read and digest the great work they do, but they write for, they write for the eyes and the mind and you read it quietly and you create the story and, you know, you, you take different. your whole opinion on it in that. Uh, television and radio journalists, I go, we write for the ear. Yeah. It's quick. It's, yeah, it's, it's very, very different. Mm. And a bit more simplistic, of course. Yeah. Because you don't have the time to like go into yeah. all the tiny details. And yeah. you're often writing just links that are setting up sort of one area where you're talking into a soundbite that someone else is coming. So your writing is not going to be it, it, like the same as print journalists. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. You're trying to just give the, the top bit, pieces of information. Yeah. And, and also then, you know, business, financial, television, journalism had moved to the wall, mm. the video wall. Um, and oh, everybody right. wanted okay. a video wall and very few people know how to, as we, we used to say, how to walk the, the wall. wall. Yeah, yeah. Walk and then the there's, there's a to total dance attached yeah. to it, you know. Okay. So this job came up and it was so funny. They were sort of friends of friends who came in. One of the board members came in to see me in the stock exchange and my contract was up in about six months. And we were just chatting about it and he said, he said, I really need to hire, he's like, somebody like you who would do this and help us get set up. And I just, on the spot, literally said, I said, I'll do it for you. I said, you're not ready yet. And it and wasn't I'm in finishing. Russian then, obviously. It was in English. The, it was in station. Russian. How did you do it? But we were just, we were setting up a channel. Oh, setting I it mean, up. Okay, literally, like, when I went there. Like a consultant. Almost. We didn't have the building yet. Okay, okay. And we were wow. in a very old Russian research institute that I remember walking these long corridors in with which fluorescent city? lights in Moscow. In Moscow. Um, and I'm not sure what kind of research was going on there, but we, we had our suspicions that it just <laughs> probably wasn't good. Oh but it was God. very interesting, you know, and we got them set up and then my job was done. I mean, but it took quite a while. So I was, I went there for a couple of months and, you know, helped to just get it set up and realize what did we want and looked at journalists. And, you know, I always say you can look and sound very boring in any language. That's so, true. Yeah. yeah so definitely. even though, you know, the whole broadcasting was going to be clearly in Russian, you were just, and at the time, they were looking very boring and sounding, <laughs> sounding bad. So like, were you, you trying know, to like get the them news. to... Yeah, we're trying to yeah. loosen them up a bit. And show them how to walk yeah. the wall, basically. And walk like, the wall, yeah, yeah, because it was, you can just imagine it was, uh, it looked and felt Quite very straight rigid. and rigid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we loosened them up a bit. There were some really interesting people. And again, that idea, there were you know, coming from an analyst background, they were coming from a print journalist background and trying to convince them that they had to, you know, do this story in like two, three minutes. Was just so Oh hard. yeah, they were like, no, yeah. no, no, this is going to take at least, you know, like half an minutes. hour. And you're like, yeah. you don't have time. You have to edit, edit, edit. And that idea of getting across the key points, getting your message across, just editing it down to what you really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a skill. Yeah. And it takes time. Of course. So, and now it's a skill I think that so many people want and need, and need and are willing yeah. to learn. Yeah. Even like writing a good headline is, it's yes, like yes. the same, you know, like that is, is a skill. Yeah. So that's a bit of a detour how yeah. I got here, but I did spend about a year in Russia and then I came back to London and we, I worked with some colleagues of mine uh, and we set up a, a company there and I was doing media training with them and then I just branched off and started doing it on my own because it was really interesting and it was easy to do mm. and there were a lot of public relations people in that space which are often not the best people to be training your executives mm. I love them dearly mm. but they're you know public relations people tend to focus so much on messaging and um, and again, you know, you you have to remind them that sometimes the messaging part is what the journalist is going to throw out. Yeah. You know, the messaging I say, it's almost like the skeleton. Mm. Now you've got to put the the meat and the, the facts. Meat, yeah. and, you know, make that all relevant and get them to storytell um, and like and get, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, 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 make it make it make it come alive. Yeah, make it come alive. So yeah. it's uh, yeah, that's the sort of journey that that started that, and then I was always doing something with the energy sector. I was still doing work when I had left television. I was working directly with OPEC, with the ministers in 
in Vienna. Okay. Um, so I would moderate their conferences. Probably the first big conference I ever moderated was the OPEC conference, which was a big energy conference in Vienna. And what was that like? Um, you know, because now moderating is, you know, I mean. But everybody thinks they can do it nowadays. So, but, but, that is, but that is true. I mean, because there are so many more conferences now as well, right? From like the top, it's a huge top business, ones yes. to the, you know, the tier one to the yeah. tier two to three, four, yeah. like really small so there are just so many people are moderating. Like you're like, the, I'm not just, you know, I think people would acknowledge like you're the queen of moderating. You introduced MBS, like his Royal Highness MBS at the last FII. You've done like some mega conferences and like presided over the whole thing. But now it's it's like a, such a big industry. Like how does that, you've seen it from the it beginning to, to now. I mean, definitely without a doubt over the last, you know, 30 years, it's just become a huge industry. Mm. And and it's become very refined, I think, too. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a place where executives and, you know, government leaders around the world, you know, get their message across. And mm -hmm. and it's that great convening of, you know, people who come together for a conference, you know, to actually discuss what's going on, anything from the World Econo Economic Forum, I mean, down to the, the simplest small, small conference. Little, yeah. But, you know, there'll be a conference for 50 people or, you know, 5,000 is a small conference mm. these days do that we go to. Over, do you think there are too many or do you think it's a good thing? No, no, no. Do you think it's a good thing that people want to have it's so many? It's definitely become a big business. I think there's plenty to talk about. Unfortunately, you know, conference organizers probably need to watch each other a little bit more because I'm finding now that, you know, my schedule is, is booking up yeah. and there's maybe two big energy conferences on the same time. Right. And I have yeah. to make that choice. And it's really tough. Mm. Um, so consequently, and it's, you know, very lucky for me. Yeah, I'm very grateful to all of the organizers who sort of think in advance. But I just took my first booking for 2026. Oh, my goodness. Not 2025. 2026. 2026. And 2025 as well. That's insane. I mean, it's just, it you really know, shows yeah. you. Yeah. Because I've, even I've noticed that... Um, there are conferences that are on at the same time as other conferences that are trying to get the same audience, yes. like you said. And they're both then vying to get the same people to go. And it, it seems like it's become, there's just too many. And some of them are both almost the same level. Like they're big conferences or big events. Yeah. And it's it's uh, where there's a bit of a challenge as well at a conference is because I do so many. Was, there was a time last year and I was doing one a week. I mean, yeah. it was just knocking them out. Yeah. Um, which is great, but I'm often touching back on the same subjects and I always have to remember it's a new audience, mm. we're in a new market, mm. and this has to sound as exciting as the first time as I did it. As the first time that you did it, yeah. Um, and that, I think, is the key, you know, to actually a good discussion and making sure that you actually have that going because it's very easy. And I find myself sometimes I have to just, you know, kind of check myself out and thinking, okay, I've done this before, but actually there's a very different audience out there. I know, yeah. And I'm we're in a different market. And while it might be the same topic, there are lots of other key and things. Like as a moderator, I mean, you know, obviously media training is one thing. I mean, somebody could be a good media trainer, but not necessarily a good mo moderator. Obviously, you're, That's doing, very true. You're, yeah. you're doing both. I've seen you moderate. I mean, people like you're booked up because you're such an uh, incredible moderator. Like you, I've, you've well, come out. You. you really are. I, I mean, it's it's actually incredibly impressive to watch you. You know, even I've seen you at FII. You just you're so calm. You're so you always seem to get the best out of the person that you're interviewing on stage or the panel that you're you're moderating. I mean, you must, we've all seen maybe moderators that aren't, you know, that are looking at their notes and they're not really engaging and the, they're losing opportunities to maybe get something good out of the panelists. What are, you know, how have you seen, have you seen an improvement? I mean, now that there are so many events, have you seen people getting better at moderating like other, you know, that the sort of level of moderating getting higher? What, what are some good tips for even that you find when you're training people to moderate? Because you have a course now as well that helps people to learn moderating, right? And that actually started, the whole training to moderate started with um, my dear friends at the Financial Times. Oh, okay. And, you know, suddenly uh, Financial Times has FT Live, which mm. is their conference arm. And I mean, just think about it. They have a great brand. Incredible uh, brand. They just, you know, and they, they developed particularly over... COVID, their conference side mm. that went, and they're still doing it. They're obviously back in person doing conferences, but they have a huge online presence and they still do that. And of course, the Financial Times is a global 
newspaper. Um, yeah. It's a global publication and they really wanted to bring all of their new staff in. Mm. I mean, back, I think when they started doing it, there was probably a few of the top journalists that moderated and that was it. But they really wanted to reflect, I think, a more dynamic, modern, relevant mm. um, publication. And they started then bringing in all of their people around the world to actually moderate part of the So the that was part sessions. of their job. The so they yeah. asked me to train them to uh, do, you know, and, and I've been doing it now for several years. That's so I amazing. still, and I really look forward to, you know, the, the group from FT Live. Because then you're training real journalists, like and not that, just, But that's yeah. where it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes because yeah. these are, you know, these are wonderful print journalists who mm. have great amount of knowledge. And when it takes them, I think when I, I talk about that idea of them writing for the eyes and the brain and the imagination and to have to flip over and now write for the ears. And it's only, I think, then that they, they get it mm. and they realize this is very, different. very different. It's very different. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of tricks and I'm in the middle of writing my ebook that will be ready soon. And we're That's putting so out exciting. some some little tips when we can on LinkedIn, particularly called The Podium and the Panel. Okay. And literally looking at all of that. And I am amazed at conferences I go to. I mean, I'm I'm not a great conference, you know, sort of uh, attendee. attendee sometimes because yeah. I sit there cringing. It must be so hard. Yeah, it must be so yeah. hard. I mean, it's it's I'm probably a little bit too subjective about it all. But you're just thinking, no, no, don't go there. Don't do that. Or you missed an opportunity. Or you missed it. Yeah, I um, think that's the one that's the most common is like missing questions that you're even when you're watching a panel, you're like, why didn't you ask mm -hmm. that? Or they were like giving you an in to ask something really great. And, and also, I think missing that engagement. I mean, I joke sometimes with my panel, you know, in advance of it. And I said, you know, really, I said, I'm, I'm the conductor of the orchestra mm. and you're, you're my orchestra. So I want to hear some drums. I want to hear some trumpets, you know, uh, give me a bit of violin if you need it there. But it's like, <laughs> I want all this to be happening. I want this dynamic within this conversation. Yeah. And all of you can bring it to me. Mm. And I keep coming back to my, you know, engage, inform, educate, inspire. And, you know, they do find that quite. Uh, That's really. Well, easy. They find it quite demanding. They go, oh, OK, so no problem at all. We will engage, inform, educate, inspire. I'm like, yeah, you've got to do these four things. Um, but but it's it's very much my role is to bring all this together and to bring out the best mm. out of each one. And, and it doesn't matter where that is, if it's, you know, there are times when it might be a bit controversial. Yeah. Um, and they, they have to to face up to, to issues. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of times when you're dealing with public relations people who will say, don't ask this, talk about this. I've had PR people literally rewrite my questions. Mm. I mean, I'm a PR person, so I'm like, I'm guilty of that. And, and come on, but, we, have, uh, <laughs> we have many great PR friends yeah. uh, in common as well, and I love of them course. dearly. Yeah. But to actually come back, and I literally you're did like, say to no. one recently, I'm like going... You know, but anyway, I said, I'll give you a bit of a brief in terms of the questions I'm going to ask. And but I'm going I won't ask them like that. But I've just given you a bit of a question form to kind of help you in a guideline. And also, you know, if someone's going to talk about investments, perhaps yeah. I don't want somebody wanting to talk about it on their first question mm. or their first answer. Mm. And somebody else want to talk about it in the middle. No. So I'd rather give them a bit of a guideline whereby we know we will talk about investments. So it's like, hold it, hold that topic because we will look at it exactly. in detail. Yeah. And it's much better when we have everybody discuss it because everyone's going to have something different mm. to say. Mm. Mm. Um, they're all coming possibly from different parts of the industry. They'll have different budgets. They'll have invested, you know, their priorities yeah. will be different. So there will be a chunk where we'll just talk about that. So... Mm. I, I do find when you're sorry, no, but no, no, it's no. about, you know, I think communicating well in advance. The preparation is just it's, unbelievable. The preparation is the most important thing. And I do think like when you get a, maybe with maybe less experience, fewer people, they might want the, oh, I have to get the question signed off. But like if you, you know, with a bit of experience, like you start to realize, I mean, the questions are never going to be asked exactly the way that you put it anyway. And someone might answer something that leads to something else coming up in the panel. So, you you know, there has to be just, it's a guide, you know, it's a guide. It's like, oh, yeah, this that's is roughly right. what we'd like to talk yes. about. And then you take it from there, you know, and then it's up to the spokesperson, whoever the panelist is, to make sure that they're kind of managing what they want to talk about. I um, the only time, you know, I will really sit very, very strictly with and, and agree on that is... If the person is not a native English speaker. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, I know how difficult it is yeah. for many executives around the world to actually hit the international exactly. stage 
and speak in English. In English. Yeah, that's so true. So, yeah. and they do put a lot of work and effort into it. So my rearranging questions for them. That's fair enough. Yeah. Is just going to throw them off completely. Yeah. yeah. And yes, they may sound a little more prepared than mm. and maybe lacking a little of the spontaneity that somebody else might have. But, you know, we're at conferences around the world now and, you know, our audience is not native English speakers. Mm. So, you know, and, and people, big investment is coming from all corners mm. of the world and we need to have everybody's voice on the panel. Yeah. So, yes, that takes a little bit of patience. Um, but it just it, it's about the prep work. And I think when you do that and you understand it, then nobody gets embarrassed. Yeah. Everybody gets to, yeah. to talk about what they want to talk about. And it fits in mm -hmm. because you've made a point mm -hmm. of fitting it in. Mm -hmm. Whereby if it's if I'm throwing questions to someone whose English is not very good, it's interrupting the flow of exactly. what we're going to ask them. Whereby if they know this is the question that I'm going to ask them, then they're ready mm -hmm. to come with, mm -hmm. you know, yes, maybe an overprepared answer. But that's fine too. It's a prepared answer. Mm -hmm. And even within there, if there are issues that you can, I want to bring up, I will tell them, them we're up, going to have yeah. to talk about that. And I will tell them in advance, you need to be able to talk about, talk about X, Y, Z, and particularly if it's something that's been in the news. So some of those big, hard hitting events that you've moderated, um, like, is there any that are there any that stand out as, you know, particularly, was there any big challenge that you faced or of an event that you found particularly challenging? And how did you overcome it that you could share? Um, I mean, they're, they're all a bit challenging. I mm. think every time I do an event, I feel like I'm doing an exam. I mean, right now, because it's uh, Ramadan here in the Middle East and we're in a bit of a quiet period, mm. I actually have a bit of downtime, but I'm in I'm in research mode. Mm. I'm, I'm literally getting ready and it almost feels like I do a verbal exam every time I go up on stage because I need to know everything that I'm doing. And sometimes I'm juggling you know, three or four panels a day. I know. Yeah. And at the moment now, I'm preparing for probably five different events, you know, from now with a timeline to, to next September that we know there is going on. So I have to be also careful. I mean, I've it, it has actually happened when I've been on a phone call to a gentleman, I think. I remember his name happened to be Francois. And I had a Francois on two different panels and you at two different point. events. And I had this fascinating conversation with one Francois completely about the other event but there was a bit of an overlap so that's yeah. he didn't uh he, neither of us twigged it for about 10 minutes and then you but then you realized <laughs> and I thought ah oh, I think you're I a think different Francois. we're here to talk about you know we were talking about space actually and my other Francois was going to talk about hydrogen and one of them had a, a lap over with a hydrogen project oh, okay. in space. So he thought that you were talking about that. And then so was, he thought he was yeah. like, where did you hear about our hydrogen project That's in space? And I was like, wow, you're doing. I thought I was talking to hydrogen. And going, now you're doing it in space. It, it was the funniest conversation. That's hilarious. OK, so that seems to roll with it. But, um, you know, I think because I will talk to all of my panel members in advance, mm. there's very few surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I know who they are. And now. I have begun to know many of them. And they're so comfortable. I mean, many of my people rarely show up too much in advance. People are like, well, we'll set a point, you know, an hour ahead if you want to meet your panel members. And we're like, we're fine. Mm. We've met. And the ones that I've talked to before and have been in my panels, they're like, we don't know, need I to do it. Yeah. No, we, we'll, we'll be there. We'll just get our mics. We're ready to go. Are there, is, it's nice. Is there anything, you know, out of, you know, that your career to date in moderating and even in journalism that you're most proud of? Getting this far, I think, <laughs> and, and and being being active and being being so busy, being booked so to twenty twenty six. I'm like, yes, yeah. this is a good sign. That is a good sign. Um, but I think also when people finish journalism, a lot of people sometimes don't know what, what to, to do. do. And you know, I'm so lucky that I'm. What I'm doing is almost an extension of being a journalist without people hating me that much and I'm not I'm not I'm not sort of if you were to cover like many of my dear colleagues like all the journalists we've covered the energy sector and when we would go to you know Vienna particularly I mean it was you know we were we were chasing ministers down mm. streets in Vienna I know, it's hard trying to get a soundbite and they didn't want to talk to you no. and you know whereas now it's a lot more organized for me it's very more it's more civilized I don't know I, I suppose I miss little bits of it but um 
No, no, I, I, I'm doing, I mean, I just, I couldn't be doing anything better. I mean, yeah. I couldn't have made this up. And I, I wouldn't, I didn't even think about it back in the day. I never thought, what would I do after? You just kept journalism. going and then it just led into this, basically. It sort of morphed into yeah. it, yes. And what, what was the best advice that you've ever received that, like, is there anything that comes to mind or, you know, a, a, a mentor, anything that someone said to you that you felt, feel guided your career? I think, well, definitely when I was in television, there were very few mentors around. I mean, I, I don't know anybody at my time that uh, a mentorship is quite a new thing. Mm. Um, and mentorship in this industry is also very new because it's very competitive mm -hmm. at all ages. So the people who are in it who have mentors, I think they're very, very lucky. And mm. companies who set up mentorship schemes, I mean, they're so, it's fabulous. Cool. Yeah. They, they do a great job. And it's something that's desperately needed. And also, I think, you know, particularly in industries to to really help women move uh, to higher positions and that. But mentorship was really a new concept. And th there wasn't anybody. Mm. There really genuinely wasn't anybody. Uh, if anything, I think it was just hugely competitive. Mm. And that's what I think I learned at an early age. You know, you just have to be very resilient. You just have to get back up and just Keep start going. again every other day. And it almost is like the business. You mm. know, the news changes every day. It's mm. uh, So it was very tough in that sense. Um, but there were very few people there to sort of hold your hand and you know, bring you, bring you up. You just, you just had to keep going. And was that like the advice, that sort of just keep going? Like, did someone ever say like something that you felt, okay, that really is going to help me or that helped you to mm. keep going? Yes. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, and there were definitely, I think when I worked at BBC World, there were certainly some of the, the management there that, uh, you know, were, were more eager, I mean, to help than yeah. probably other places, but in general. Um, and then consequently, I think I adapted a bit of that. Um, I mean, I remember when I worked in the U.S. and I was back just seeing some friends of mine and I worked on the news desk where, you know, you're just coordinating all the coverage. And um, I, I didn't even realize it, but one of the, the reporters, one of the former reporters had come in and literally he kind of, we walked in there and he goes, and he was just like, how are you doing? He's going, don't get comfortable now. Don't get comfortable. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God. And he was like, you would always say that. He's like, we just have, we'd be starting the shift and you're like going, don't, don't get comfortable. We've got this to do. We got this, 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 this. And I'm like going, oh, my God. Is so, um, yeah, I think we we just, it's a, it's, it's a different industry. It's an interesting industry. But it's also changing so much. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd want to be a journalist right now. Anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, well, I guess like the big media outlets, ever, I, I feel like people revere journalists so much, like, you know, Financial Times, Bloomberg, CNBC, all of those. But like, but that's the easy stuff. We're the business journalists. We're, yeah. we're in the safe spot. Yeah. I mean, the real heroes of are journalism. The ones, oh, God. You yeah. know, like are the ones that, many of my dear yeah. colleagues who, you know, were foreign correspondents yeah. and went to war. And it's something I didn't do. Mm. And probably if I look back, there's a part of me that would have absolutely loved to have mm. done it. Mm. Um, and I always feel had I stayed at BBC World Service rather than make that move to Bloomberg when I did, I would have probably traveled gone and, and gone road. somewhere. Yeah, that would have been. Yeah, that's I mean, those journalists are they're heroes. Yeah, yeah, they, they really, really are. are. I mean, yeah. and they're still doing an incredible Good job. Jobs. There's so many of them. Yeah. Mm. What is there something that you like if you could go back in time to when you were kind of starting? Is there something that you wish you could tell your younger self, like something that you know now that you could share with your younger self? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think I began to see it from younger journalists and journalists coming in the business, particularly in America. This idea they would come in, they'd say, I'm going to stay here for two years. And if I'm not getting a promotion um, or a better job, I'm out of here and I'm moving. And in America, you could do that. You could mm -hmm. literally go to another market. And that flexibility was there. And in this industry, it doesn't matter. You know, if two years is more than enough to stay in one place. Whereby I think I was on a traditional career path an odd time, you know, you so just, I would just work hard and think people would notice. They don't notice. If you're working hard and doing your job and you're good at it, chances are you're going to stay there because replacing you will, will be because, too hard. Yeah, it will be too hard. And when I did uh, the news desk, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a sort of coveted position. If a news director knows you know how to run a news desk, they're like, please, you, do, you have to do the desk. Yeah. You've got to, you know, it's like, oh, my God, why am I doing the desk? And that happened to me when I came back to London because they, they knew I had, you know, been assignment editor. Um, and fine, you, you end up with the 
they used to joke with me when I was leaving the US, you know, they're like, who's getting your who's getting your little black book? You know, it's just it's like mm, you have the golden Rolodex. Yeah. Um, and you end up, you know, creating these contacts year after year. Of course you do, because people trust you to give them uh, your details and you're, you have a sort of a relationship. And I'm amazed. I get called by the strangest people saying, um, you know, would you work with us? We might see some synergies. You have all these contacts and you know, X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, 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 I have those contacts for a very, very different reason. And if I suddenly start saying to my contacts, and by the way, you know, there's an investment opportunity here no. to yeah. introduce to somebody. So I'm like, no, 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 that's not why I have them. That's not what I'm going to do. Mm. So of that, course that's not. Yeah. That's yeah. so that's, oh, it's totally out of order. Yeah. But I'm amazed the amount of people that, um, you know, I, I get invitations on LinkedIn from so many people yeah. saying, look at your, you know, contact list. I'd love to, to work with you. And you're thinking, you probably need a full time job would. to answer all your LinkedIn <laughs> messages nowadays. So. Like people, yeah. And what about, what about, what are you most proud of, do you think, in your career so far? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I guess navigating my way to, to be able to do what I did in a, in a way because I did it with very little direction, mm. I think. Um, and I think now a lot of, you know, younger girls, even at, at high school have a much better feel maybe. And, and actually, no, they don't. That's not true. Cause I talked to many of them and they have no idea what they want to do. Um, and it's, it's really tough for them to make that decision. But the fact that I actually did manage to, to just find it, but then again, we all did mm. back in the day. I mean, I'm not alone in this, no, but still, like you know, you it was just a tougher environment and you really, you didn't have a whole lot of support and there were very few role models to look up. To. Um, so you just, you just had to find your way and you just had to do it. Mm. So, I mean, in, in that sense, and, and also I think trying to, you know, my, uh, my my family didn't really know where I was going with this. Not too many people from our town back in the day worked in international television. Yeah. So they weren't really, you know, they convinced that I was going to do it. Doing. And I was doing it in America at a time when, well, they couldn't see I was doing it. Yeah. And I do remember once somebody saying, he said, yeah, I talked to your father. He said, he thinks you work in television or something like that. <laughs> You're like, yes, like, I do. Thinks. Okay. <laughs> So, and speaking about the younger girls or, you know, generation now, what advice do you give them when they ask you, like if, if they're starting out in their career, what would you, what advice would you give somebody coming into this industry or just generally like? Particularly coming into this industry. I mean, the one thing I would always tell them is to just start doing it. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my assistant Rose, sorry, her, her daughter is 10 okay. and she's doing, um, She's doing audio and making recordings and doing so. She's incredible at 10 years of age. And uh, so she's won some new broadcasting or a minor in her school. Wow. But at 10 and she's so good. good. And to see a young girl like that with just the spirit and the enthusiasm. And you're like, you can do this. And the way to do it is start doing stories about, I don't know, the neighborhood. Start doing stories about your friends at school. That's start so doing cool. stories about who's got a pup or something, yeah. just any little thing, but start doing that. And now, you know, when everybody has access to literally free broadcast or free narrow cast, mm. um, the idea that you can put on a channel and you can talk about anything at any age. It's amazing. It is yeah. really amazing. And it's just starting to do it and building it up. Um, it, it's just, it's so wonderful to do it. And there's another young girl Kiara, who is, you know, she's what, she's all of about 12 here. And um, she's, you know, she talks at the UN and she talks wow. about gender and women's rights. And uh, she's originally um, from India. Well, her family background's Indian. And she's so articulate. And, and she's out there just doing it. So, I mean, she's definitely headed in that direction. But starting when you know what you want to do and you've got that passion and, and she's very fluent and she's very confident speaking and it's just so lovely to, to see, see it. That. Yeah. So that, you know, the fact that they can do that at a young age and I hope they never lose no, that yeah. spirit and never, you know, think it shouldn't be what they should do because within what they'll do and it could, it could go any direction, mm, mm. but it's about doing it rather than thinking, oh yeah, when a particular thing in the media right now, you can mm. begin to create that, at any age, you can and build your own podcast, you can write your own stories, mm. you can do all of that. So 
and we can see that it has happened. I think particularly after COVID, where many of the people who had started podcasts here, and some of them I looked at and thought, ooh, they need a bit of polish, they need a bit of work. Um, and yeah, uh, pure practice gave them all the polish and work they needed, and some of them look fabulous That's now. Right, yeah. And well done. And it really is about putting the effort in, putting the work in, being able to just get stuck in and do it and do it again and, you know, fail fast, so to speak, and just get up and do another one and do a better one the next time. Exactly. And that's what, what happens yeah. all the time. So mm. it's the possibilities out there, I think, are endless in that right now. And and with with the possibilities, like w the way that the people are communicating now and, you know, how we're digitally connecting more and more in AI how do you see that affecting the role of a moderator or a journalist? I mean, do you think that eventually like an AI per will be the person moderate or, or a journalism? How we're Well, we were at a conference not too long ago and they programmed an AI moderator okay. in. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was quite funny. Um, but, but it was very static and it was very programmed and, you know, on something like that, yeah, you knew the question that was coming up because they fed the questions into the AI, uh, the bot, you know, and uh, they gave her a name and everything. I had to come up afterwards. I just, as I said, I'm not coming on stage after that. So I stayed on the floor and I'm like, no, nope. uh, um, I, I had a little, I had a little tantrum going, see, you it's clapped for rubbish. her, you did all of that yeah. stuff. And it's like, you know, fine. Uh, but it was, it was interesting. But my friend, uh, you know, here who does, you know, a lot of, uh, public speaking stuff, Flo, uh, Flo has just, uh, you know, put out his AI moderators. I'm dying to see what he's doing. I just saw it and I'm like, going, okay, how are you going to do this? But he's obviously got a plan and it's, it's there. So I'm going to check him and see what he's doing with mm. it. But, you know, everyone thought after COVID that the whole new model for conferences might just stay online. Yeah. People genuinely did. And there was fear in the industry. I think a lot of people talking about, Ooh, what are we going to do? You know, this this industry might be finished. And I don't know. It was probably ever. a week later. And I remember particularly, you know, the big, the first big Adipec event that's here in the Middle East and it's in Abu Dhabi and it's just the most incredible, it's, it's, you know, the biggest energy show on earth. I mean, it's just a fabulous show. But I think the first one that came back on that at after COVID was unbelievably packed. Everyone I mean, just wants to be We person. just couldn't believe yeah. the numbers that were there. I mean... People were back mm. in person mm. and there might have been a few people that might have been able to travel. And that was even then maybe accepted that you could come in during video. But right now, if you're going to come on a video message, you better be something, somebody really important. Yeah. Otherwise, you better show up in yeah. person or, you know, you don't have a seat. Exactly. Yeah. But um, no, I, I think that, you know, people want to connect. They want to come together. The whole events industry and particularly here in this region you know, it, it's thriving and it's, there's, and also the dynamics of what I'm doing at the moment, particularly in the energy sector, in the maritime sector, in the mining sector, that's sort of my space mm. infrastructure. It is just, you know, it's, there's so much, much going on. Yeah, there's so much happening. There's a, you know, a new industrial revolution going on there. There's an energy transition. There's so much happening in every space. And everybody's connected to it. And everybody wants to talk about it. It's a very, it's a, it's a hugely exciting time, time. right now. It yeah. really is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you said that last year was your busiest year, right? So now you're already booked up for two more years. So long may it continue, you know. Yeah. So you've, you've reached this point now in your career. What, what does, how do you define success now? I mean, you said that you couldn't have imagined sort of having this, reaching this point and what you've carved out for yourself. How do you define success? Success, I think, is, is staying relevant and being very much part of the conversation, I think, particularly in what I do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that is so, so important to me. And, um, you know, I'm amazed when I do media training. Sometimes I'll always say to people, you know, look just outside your industry as well and look to see what's impacting it and be curious about that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think the, the day we stop being curious is a sad day for the world. And unfortunately, I think it's beginning to happen. Uh, but it's so vitally important, I think, that we we constantly, you know, look. I'm, I, I, one thing that really annoys me is the movement out there that says you are enough. I know it's not very politically correct to say that at the moment. Um, but it's, we all have such great potential. Mm. And I think we only live maybe a quarter of that potential sometimes. And... You know, the fact that we, 
you know, and it's 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 okay if you don't want to do something, you don't want something bigger, better, whatever, that's fine too. But, you know, the fact that we actually, you know, have, that so we're much. here, that we're alive, that we can think and we can make new decisions and we can do new things and we can do, you know, in a free society, whatever yeah. we want. Why would you not do Why? more? Mm. I mean, and have fun doing it and mm. learn along the way. And get better and, you know, evolve. Yeah, it's yeah. just, there's, there's just great opportunities. What, what's, what, what are some things that you're looking to do next? Oh, at the minute, I'm just juggling too much. I mean, really? uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I sometimes have to say maybe, maybe, maybe enough for today. <laughs> but um, no, at the minute, I mean, th there's a book going on for the last five years. I know it's, you have uh, to get it's that out. I, I need to get that out. I need to stop talking about that book. But uh, uh, Own the Space is in the works and it's, it, it is moving hmm. without a doubt. And I'll get that because that's very much what I, what I preach, what I teach. Hmm. And, you know, when people understand what I talk about, they get it. Hmm. And I think it's I can see the transformation for them when they can step into, as I said, by the time they come to me, they own their own space. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not about own your space. By the time you come to talk to me, you own that space already. Now it's about stepping out and making sure that you own the bigger space. Mm. And so that book is is in the works and it's, I add to it in our time. But, you know, luckily I, I, I do have a good excuse. I have been very busy. You have been very busy. And and does that book have, you know, um, examples of case studies of people you've worked with, like how e-trainer media has affected your clients' lives? Um, and not really. I The clients I work with, I always work, I almost work with them like, I'm a psychologist. It's very funny. People are like, ask me, going, do you have any videos of your media training? And I'm like, no, no, these are private events, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that makes this sense. This is nobody's yeah. business but myself and the executive or whoever I'm working from. And if I hear them and see them, of course, I'll send them a little note saying how wonderful they sounded. And very often I'll get a, a little note back saying, yeah, own that space. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not, you know, I, I don't have any desire or any right to say, you know, I taught them all they knew. Yeah. And why course. would I? My my job is, you know, to, to make them succeed. They're paying me to do it. So my job's done. That's the best type of tra media trainer. You know, it's really, it, it, you're behind the scenes. Your job is, right? It's yeah. just. Oh, no, I mean, I have not, just, I have yeah. no desire. And, I, and it just, it does actually annoy me to see, you know, people almost exploit it. I think yeah. if, you know, if you've been paid for it and it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one and it's at that level, you know, unless that person wants to make a big deal out of it. Because it's kind of a vulnerable thing, right? Oh, yeah. Going through media training or, or presentation training. Oh, yeah, training. with me, definitely. <laughs> with, but if you're good, because you kind of break, the person can start from a really, it depends where they're starting from. But if it's somebody that's, you know, quite nervous and is not experienced, like to get to get them to sort of evolve and, you know, um, become a better communicator. Absolutely. But even when they are very experienced and they know their job and they're a CEO, and yes, maybe on a communication level, there's something at that level to be able to tell them, you know, exactly. this sounds ridiculous. Yeah. You can't say that. So, you know, they've got That's to trust you. a private you. thing. Yeah. It's very private. Yeah. And, you know, you have to make it a bit of fun. You don't want to insult right. people too no, much. No. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you have to wake no, people up. Exactly. I mean, yeah. and I've had this once. I had a head of uh, HR actually who attended an event come and said to me, he said, I find you um, very abrupt and, you know, our company is a very caring, sharing, listening company. Um, and, you know, he said, I really don't think this is how you should be dealing with our executives. And I said, well, you know, all I can tell you is, it's like you put them out there. I mean, you think I'm bad. Wait till, we they, wait till they meet real journalists and they don't know their figures. They don't know their facts. And they're not able to actually talk about what's going on here. I'm going, eh, and then you'll, you'll wish that I maybe gave them a little bit more of a hard time. But, you know, these are senior leaders in their field here and they don't have the facts and they can't answer a question. So how would you like me to respond to them? You know, I'm sorry. That They're not a... going to hear me if I say, well, that was very good. But what might make it better would be mm. a bit of this. Mm. That's that's never been my style. Yeah. And I actually I don't think. Well, that's why you're good at, That's why you're the best. People hear that. I think all they hear is that was very good. Yeah. No, you're Where totally about I probably right. flip it the other way. So. No, you're totally right. And that's why you're the best at what you do. So, <laughs> it can be a little um, bit harsh. That's what. That's why you're the best. Tough though. love, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it's tough love. It's tough love. And that's why people go to you. So 
Um, Ethna, I just want to thank you for your time tonight. That this was such an interesting, completely like insightful, revealing conversation and really appreciate your time. It's been great fun. Lovely to have this opportunity and time to chat and good luck with all your other podcasts. Thank you. Thank you, Ethna. Thanks. Thank you.